Well, welcome everyone, and thanks for coming out on this chilly evening tonight to hear about the biblical implications of a Brexit, that is, a British exit from the European Union. Well, what a fascinating few months it has been as, as Britain has been gearing up to, to vote on the question of whether or not to leave the European Union. And it's something that there has been an enormous amount of, of news about. And even as I was, I was driving in here tonight on the way in, um, I flicked on the radio and um, ABC News Radio was covering the upcoming vote. And um, of course, you know, Britain's a long way away and here we are in Australia and we're hearing about that news. So tonight we're going to have, uh, we're going to drill down into this a bit and we're going to look at why Britain is having this vote, um, what really is the point of it, um, and then we're going to take a step back and consider this in the context of prophecy. Because we want to understand what what does the Bible actually say about the implications of a Brexit? Um, does Britain even feature in the Bible? And if it does, what is in store for Britain and the whole world after this vote? So just, so just for, I mean, because of course we're here as Bible students and, we're, and, we're, um, and as followers of Christ, those of us here, um, we believe that, that world events and global geopolitics and the various stratagems of the nations that are happening on, at the moment are all subject to the will and purpose of God. And however, um, with five days to go before a vote, um, sentiment around the world is not calm. It's fearful. Um, politicians, economists, academics and investors are all perplexed over the possibility of a Brexit. And the fear that, that is spreading around the nations is, is not just the impact um, of a Brexit on Britain, or, or even Europe for that matter. Um, the fear of the consequences of a Brexit is felt all around the world. It's dominating Wall Street. It's dominating central bank decision making. It's dictating the, the price of commodities, the value of the pound, um, and so on and so forth. And um, only a couple of hours ago, this was actually a, um, a news article that was posted by Reuters, who are a very reliable uh, most of the time, news source. Um, and I'll just quickly, briefly read over this. Um, it says that if Britain votes to take their country out of the European Union on June the 23rd, no corner of the global financial market complex will emerge unscathed. The invisible thread that links assets as diverse as gold, bank stocks and Japanese yen and government bonds will be yanked sharply by a Brexit. Um, and with global interest rates and bond yields at the lowest on record, central bank banks running low on crisis fighting tools and the post-2008 economic recovery flagging, that thread could quickly unravel with serious consequences for all markets. Um, and the, only, uh, the other day um, I was just speaking to the director of a multi-million dollar company which happens to be listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. And I asked him, how bad would a Brexit be for your company? You know, it's an Australian company, thinking that perhaps um, the share price might drop a bit or something, um, but that it would be nothing particularly significant. Very bad, replied the director to my question on the impact of a Brexit on this company. And that, that is how widespread the impact um, will be on nations and corporations around the world. If a, if a Brexit happens, it will send shockwaves around the world and it, it will feel it here in Adelaide as well. And so while our focus tonight is on the biblical implications of a Brexit, um, and while there is a few implications that we'll go through and consider tonight, this possible Brexit is one issue of a number of core global problems that are slowly dragging developed economies um, into a downward spiral. Um, and for many, the situation is hopeless. Um, yet for those who read the word of God, um, we know that both Daniel and Paul remind us fundamentally that whatever happens, God has the last say. Um, both Paul and Daniel remind us that what is happening right now on this earth is a precursor for a greater plan and a greater time, a time that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about when he was on this earth 2,000 years ago. And you say, well, it's been 2,000 years since Christ was on the earth. What happened? Jesus was an influential man who came and went, nothing more, nothing less. To which I respond, 
Look at the revival of Israel, which the Bible prophesied would happen. Look at Britain, which we're going to consider tonight. These events that are happening around us are, are biblical signs that are telling us that this 2,000-year period is about to finally close its chapter. And there are many biblical signs that, that we could go through, which are all crying out to those who are listening, signs which show that the Lord Jesus Christ is about to return, as he said he would, to become king on this world, of this world. Well, let's get some context, um, because we need to understand what the European Union is really all about before we attempt to even try and understand the significance of the vote. Well, it was in 1945 that the European Union was founded. Uh, that was, of course, at the end of World War II. And that was 71 years ago. Um, and just as World War II ended 71 years ago, European unifica the unification, sorry, the European Unification Project, which is now the European Union, um, has been going on for 71 years. Um, and as World War II was beginning to, to come to a close, the human and economic impact um, of the war became obvious, and it was horrific. The continent worst hit was Europe. The war had reminded the world and left a deep impression in Europe that never again would the people of Europe want to experience extremism and fear and um, that, those kinds of things that were felt through you know, the Holocaust and, and the other massacres that happened during that war that weren't were necessarily related to the Jews. And so around that time, at the very end of that war, the European nations bonded together in the belief that never again would they go to war with each other. And on that basis, they formed the European Unification Project. And if you go to the, the European Union website today, you'll find this sentence explaining the reason why the Union was created. The European Union, it says, was set up with the aim of ending the frequent and bloody wars between neighbours which culminated in the Second World War. And to some degree, there's some truth in that. If you consider that the 71 years since the Second World War, um, there really hasn't been um, a war of the, of the proportions that we saw in World War II. And so if we look at the 71 years of its existence, the, the European Union has evolved and grown and attempted to become a, a political and economic pillar of the European continent and its people. It has been a bastion for humanism and has tried to be a champion for European unity um, in the belief that together the member states have greater influence on the world stage. Well, the project seemed like a grand idea until recently. You see, the two pillars that the, the European Union brings to European society are freedom of movement and freedom of trade. And for years, these two principles upheld the integrity and the justification for the Union. Um, without these two pillars, the purpose of the Union was really just to avoid war on the continent. But within the last five years, the pillars have begun to crack and crumble. And it's almost like two wheels have come off the European Union bandwagon. And the back of the wagon is, is grinding um, a path in the bitumen and sparks are flying everywhere as the drivers struggle to bring the crisis under control. But the more they try to bring the crisis under control, the more they lose control. And this is obvious when you, you pull out the microscope to inspect the integrity of the two so-called European pillars of integration. The first pillar of the European project was the plan to have a single currency which helped promote free trade. And that currency became known as the euro. And um, the area in which the euro was traded became known as the eurozone. And originally, for Europe, the dream was simple. One currency and free trade. Um, but the EU became a bit zealous and they began to add some more southern European states which had notoriously unsustainable financial systems. And within years, the Eurozone had included debt-ridden nations like Greece. And as these nations joined, the European Union tried different things to get these nations' debt problems under control. They tried austerity, which caused mass riots um, they tried bailouts, which only exacerbated the problems. But it became more and more obvious that this was a dream that was not going to be easily achieved. 
And so the issue has become progressively worse um, and could flare up again, interestingly enough, next month um, in Greece, where they have their next debt repayment due to the European Union. Well, the second pillar of European integration is known as the Schengen Agreement. And for those who are unaware, the Schengen Agreement took place um, around 1985, and it effectively allowed the European people unrestricted travel between member states. And here we have one of the results of the Schengen Agreement, the border between Spain and Portugal, um, if you can see that. Um, you don't see any guards or any crossings um, or checkpoints. All you see is a nice blue sign saying, courtesy of the European Union, you get to cross the border whenever you like. And then the Arab Spring happened in 2010. And from that moment on, thousands of migrants started pouring into Europe. Well, it was bad, but at that point it wasn't cataclysmic until Russia invaded <laughs> Syria. And immediately the migrant flows into Europe skyrocketed. Um, some of you might remember the drone footage in late 2015 as hundreds of thousands of migrants um, who had had their houses destroyed in, in Syria and, and other places trudged across the European landscape like colonies of ants towards the economic centre of the European Union. And within months, the, the pillar of free travel in Europe, the Schengen Agreement, became pointless as migrants flooded Europe. But member states were, were bound by EU regulation and they were powerless to stop it. Well, terrorism hit France. And immediately states like France and Belgium evoked emergency border controls and kept those controls in place to stem the flow of migrants. And so now you have a situation in Europe where the pillar of the Union, the Schengen Agreement, which, which enforces open borders, is nothing more than a piece of paper. Because member states have evoked the emergency clause of the agreement which allows them to close their borders in situations of war. And so as a, as a possible Brexit is now looming on the scene, the EU is facing the greatest crisis yet. You know, one Wall Street economist said that despite the enormity of, what the, of the issues that the EU has faced until now, these issues pale into insignificance when compared to the damage that a Brexit would do to the European Union. Well, I'm going to take you through a couple of, of newspaper articles which have all appeared over the last um, couple of months. Most of them are actually the last week or so. Um, in the lead up to this Brexit, just to give an idea of what world leaders are really thinking and saying about the po possibility of this happening. Well, the first one there, um, apologise that it's not particularly clear, um, that's Tony Blair. Um, most of you might recognise him as being the, the former Prime Minister of Britain. And his view was that the, a, a Brexit would have seismic consequences for particularly Britain, the economy of Britain. Um, the, that person there is the Governor of the Bank of England um, and he also had some very grave concerns about the, the state of the economy after a Brexit. Um, Mr Obama came out as well and said that um, a Brexit would have um, a dire impact on the trade between um, Europe and other, um, Britain and other countries. Um, and Merkel, the, uh, probably the most powerful person in the European Union, much against the advice of the current Prime Minister of Britain, came out and, and warned the United Kingdom against um, going, uh, leaving the European Union. And likewise, Donald Tusk, the European Council President, um, came out and said the same thing. He said that, but he specifically was referring to um, the destruction of Western political civilization as a result. Um, and you may remember um, on Tuesday this week, um, it was in the news. The, the Australian market and, in fact, global markets took a, a ma major nosedive um, on the news that a, a, a Brexit would be possible. And that was because um, in the United Kingdom they're polling this particular question and, those, and the, the response was coming back saying that those who, who want to leave, um, their, their voice is a lot stronger at this point. So the, the share markets reacted and the Australian share market took a dive. $30 billion was wiped off the Australian share market in one day. David Cameron, current Prime Minister of Britain, said, 
a Brexit could lead to Europe descending into war. And you can kind of understand what he's talking about when this um, system was actually created at the end of World War II. What happens if that system is destroyed um, afterwards? Um, OK, so the president of Poland um, coming out saying that uh, Brexit would trigger a collapse of the European Union. Um, and some of you may remember Yanis Varoufakis, the um, finance minister of Greece, who was particularly prominent during the, the Greece financial crisis. Um, he actually is not just a politician, he is also an academic economist. Um, so you'd think that he might know a bit more about this than most people. Um, well, he said that a Brexit risks hastening the collapse of the European Union and plunging the continent into the chaos of the 1930s. Um, if you remember, that was the era of the Great Depression. Um, and, and of course, the US billionaire Soros, and um, on the picture there is the, the fin Finland Greek, sorry, the Finland finance minister saying the same thing. Just a couple more. Wolfgang Schobel, the German finance minister, and, and all of these people are European leaders that are saying this, um, mostly. Um, he said it would be a disaster if, if a Brexit happened. He said that political leaders in Berlin um, are deeply concerned about the withdrawal, possible withdrawal of Britain. And lastly, this is the, the French Prime Minister. Um, and he was, again, concerned. He said the whole of European civilization is under grave threat. Um, the departure of the UK would be a fatal blow. It would be a tragedy, he said. Mr. Vowles warned that the European system is alarmingly fragile. Europe could lose its historical footing and the project could die quickly. Things could fall apart within months, he told the World Economic Forum in Davos. And so there you have it. There's a chorus of voices, um, politicians, economists, who do not want a Brexit. They fear the instability that it could bring to Britain and Europe and the entire world. And yet despite the threats, the fear and the consternation around the globe, one formidable force in Britain is convincing the British public that they need to leave Europe. And that formidable force is called the Brexit campaign. And it's being led by a very, very influential man called Boris Johnson, who you may have heard of as well. Boris is the ex-mayor of London, and he's considered to be more popular than the Prime Minister of Britain. And he's now using that influence to oppose the current stand of the Prime Minister and galvanise support around Britain to, to take back control and leave Europe. Well, we're going to take a, a look at the momentum behind this Brexit campaign in, in Britain. Um, so there's a, what we're going to see, I'm, I'm just going to skip to the second video. Um, so this second, this video is a, um, is a documentary called The Brexit Movie and some of you may or may not have heard of it. Um, I'm going to show a brief excerpt of the video, it's a few cuts. Um, it's going to go for about nine minutes. Um, hopefully this gives an idea of what um, some of the reasons behind why the British public are really desperate to leave the European Union. So this video is not a reflection of, of my views or of anyone else's views here. It's um, particularly not on democracy. It's, it's what is important about this video is it's giving us an idea of what the people in Britain are thinking and why they want to leave. We, the people, are being cajoled, frightened and bullied into surrendering our democracy and freedom. This film is a rallying cry. We must fight for our independence, for the right to determine ourselves, the laws under which we live, and for the freedom to shape our own future. This is the most important voting decision that any of us is going to make in our lifetime. With general elections, it doesn't really matter who you vote for, Conservative or Labour, because you know that in four years' time you can change your mind. This time you can't change your mind. This time is for keeps. In this film, we'll see how the EU works. It's like heaven for the politician or bureaucrat because it's power without accountability. It was devised to make sure that the great mass of the people could not control government ever again. The EU is turning into a dictatorship and this is not um, overstating it. We will see what the EU has done to Britain. 
The EU has just obliterated the English fishing industry altogether. The European policies that we face are really the single biggest threat to our competitiveness. We'll see why Fortress Europe has been such a calamity for the European economy. What we see is the EU bringing up the drawbridge. The European Union has become an economic basket case. Certainly it is not in our economic interests to remain within the European Union. No way. We will look at the risks of tying our fate to the failing EU. Extremism at both ends is being fostered by the anti-democratic nature of the European Union. Far from being it safer for us to be in the EU, there are dangers that go along with us being members of the EU, being dragged into situations we don't want to get in. And we look at how independence could transform Britain. We have huge scope, huge scope for creating vast numbers of new jobs. Outside Europe, we could have prosperity on a level that we can't even imagine now. We're being asked to give up the right to govern ourselves. What are we being offered in return that could possibly be worth it? Just shows utter contempt for what they think people are like because they really do believe that these little trinkets are going to buy us off. What really matters is that you should have the power to remove the people who govern you. We're about to choose how we want to live our lives. This is the single most important political decision any of us will make in our lifetimes. It's been more than 40 years since we were last asked. It could be a half century before we're asked again, if we're asked at all. I think this is the last chance that we'll be able to vote on EU membership when we still have a recognisable identity as Britons. And what makes it scary is that if we go the wrong way, we're in it for certainly my lifetime and probably my kids' lifetime. People might not understand exactly how the functions of the British Constitution work, but they get the gist of it. Once every five years, we go down the school hall or to a church, we put a cross in a ballot paper, they're all counted up, and the chap with the most votes wins. We get that. You try working out how a European commissioner is appointed. It's positively Kafkaesque. You can't actually get your head around who does what, why, and who is answerable to who. The European Union, which imposes laws on 28 countries, is made up of seven main institutions, which include the European Council, the Council of the European Union, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the European Commission, and the European Parliament. Do you know the difference between the European Council the Council of the European Union and the Council of Europe? It's a very good question. I mean, how many presidents there are of the European Union? Uh, how many presidents? Yeah. I'd guess of one. There's two presidents, for goodness sake. I don't know what the difference between the two four. presidents is. There's four presidents, you say. There are squads of committees and presidents of this and commissioners of that. The expression I really hate is pooled sovereignty. It's bollocks. Problem number two. Recognise this man? No. No. <laughs> Do you recognise that man? No. I challenge you to name almost any of them. Do you recognise this guy? No. Was that chap Juncker? Is he one of them? I didn't know whether it was just the British being a bit thick, so I thought I'd ask some folk in Brussels. Oh, yeah, yeah, sir. <laughs> Martin. 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 Can you tell me who that is? No. <laughs> no. 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 Who are all of these Eurocrats? Who are they answerable to? Ah, but here we come to problem number three. Accountability. Would it help if you knew who they were? Because you don't have any power over them, so what's the point? In the EU, there's a thing called a parliament. But it's not a parliament as we know it. In the EU, the parliament isn't in charge. If you ever known anyone, know who their MEP is, nobody does. It's because we know that they're not actually being voted into a meaningful position of lawmaking. This is the only parliament the world's ever invented where you cannot initiate legislation, propose legislation, or even the repeal of legislation. All of that comes from the unelected European Commission. So you can't propose a law and try and get it passed? No, absolutely not. Parliamentary democracy, once every five years, you can throw everything out of the window and start again. With this, once something is European law, there is nothing 
to a democratic process, the voter can do to change it. The people whom we elect to go to Brussels have almost no power at all. They do what they're told. Got even less power than the House of Lords, for goodness sake. Our votes for these people are pointless. They are fundamentally pointless. The European Parliament is an irrelevance. The European Union bureaucratic structures who are appointed, not elected, have all the real power. The real power in the EU, including the power to legislate, resides not with the Parliament, but with EU officials. They debate their laws in secret. We are not allowed to hear or read their deliberations. Do you know the name of Britain's a European Commissioner? No. Have you heard of Jonathan Hill? No. 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 Did you vote for him? No. Did I vote for him? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. We are now subjects of a vastly complex state machine run by anonymous officials whom we didn't elect, but who have the power to impose on us laws that we haven't debated and have no democratic means of repealing. People who say to you that the European Union is undemocratic fundamentally misunderstand the European Union. It is anti-democratic. But to EU officials and politicians, it's like a warm bath. It's like heaven for the politician or bureaucrat because it's power without accountability. The reason why all the major political parties are massively in favour of Europe is because when their careers are blown out of the water here, they're stumbling around for a job. No commercial organisation is going to hire them. There's only one place that will hire them. They can get a job there which gives them the freedom not to have to face the electorate. It's extremely well paid. It's more or less permanent. They don't have any constituents and they don't have any worry about being thrown out at elections. So they say, stay with the European project, I'll be making myself two, three hundred grand a year. It'll be fantastic and at the end of it I'll get a period. It's great. Since they're not directly accountable to the taxpaying public, EU politicians and bureaucrats have understandably been more than generous to themselves in pay and perks. This is the much talked about Brussels gravy train. And here's my handy guide. This is the shopping centre. But this is all for politicians and bureaucrats, it's not for members of the public? No. So you get your own hair salon and your nail bar. Get your nails done. Your nails done. There's a sauna, there's a massage parlour as yeah. well. Why would they not want to stay here living a life of luxury? There are a number of people here who are paid more than the British Prime Minister. Ah, oh, you might say, but how many? Four, ten, a hundred? Ten thousand. There are ten thousand people here paid more than David Cameron. That's one in five of everyone who works for the EU. Right, so there's at least 10,000 people who work for the European Union who earn more than the British Prime Minister. When you consider that there is, that Britain is paying the European Union at least $50 million a day, you can see there's one reason right, right there why they want out. Uh, and if you want to see the remainder of that document documentary, it actually goes for an hour and 20 minutes. Um, you can see it on prophecynews.com as well. Well, we've seen why many British want to leave the European Union. But the question is, what next? What if Britain does, want to vo does, does vote leave to leave the European Union? What would happen to Europe? Well, this is a Bloomberg chart which looks at the first... Um, 100 days in Europe after a Brexit, in theory. Um, it's based on, on research. So um, just, to, just to look at a couple of, of countries in Europe, um, France, for example, is um, fostering uh, far-right parties, political parties, who also want to leave the European Union. Um, and they've got their presidential elections next year. So next year, they could be facing the same issue that Britain is facing now. Um, the same issue for Spain. Um, and Greece, as you will probably be already be aware, has is, is been wanting to, to leave for some time, but they're kind of um, obligated to stay within the EU if they, if they want to be receiving money for food and the basic things at the moment. So that uh, is a breakdown of the, the entire European project, and it could go, very downhill, uh, could go downhill very, very quickly after a Brexit. We, we don't know, and that'll be interesting to see what happens. 
Well, what does it all mean? What does the Bible actually say will happen? Well, the first thing to point out is that the Bible does not predict the outcome of, of the vote in five days. Britain might well choose to stay within the European Union, but what the Bible does talk about is a time in the future when Britain will oppose Europe. And it's particularly interesting, uh, sorry, it's particularly important to be aware of these prophecies for the simple reason that they all relate to the return of Christ. You know, most people talk about Christ, um, they, but not many people know about his prophecies or his, his teachings. And we're now going to take a look at some of these prophecies. Now, I do apologise because we're only able, got, able, going to be able to cover these um, topics in principle. Um, in order to fully understand these concepts, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be able to cover this in one night. Um, but I do hope to provide an overview, and if you have any questions afterwards, by all means, feel free to, to, to ask me afterwards. So there is at least three prophecies in Scripture that relate to Europe and Britain in the last days. Now, now don't get me wrong, there is definitely more prophecies that talk about particularly uh, Europe at the end of the Bible, but there is about three prophecies that relate to the relationship between Britain and Europe, um, directly or indirectly. So just to look at these very briefly, and we'll cover those, these uh, in a minute, what we, get, what we will see as Revelation 17, which is the last chapter in the Bible, prophesies is that the papacy's influence in Europe will increase and Brexit will contribute to that. Um, the second thing to note is that um, both Revelation 17 and Daniel 2 talk about this, that a confederate of European nations will arise that does not include Britain. The third one is that Britain will eventually oppose Europe um, and Russia who seek to invade Israel. Ezekiel 38, as we read in our reading earlier. Um, and the last one, which is related to all of these, is that Jesus Christ will return to the earth. So if you just turn with me to Revelation chapter 17, where we have the image of the woman riding upon the beast. Uh, and what you see on the screen there is a picture of Europa, which is the symbol of Europe. It's a symbol which sits out the front of the European Union headquarters in Brussels. It's a slightly different picture to the picture of the woman described in Revelation 17. But they're both based upon the same thing. In Revelation 17, the beast represents Europe and the woman represents the Catholic papacy. And if we read from verse 3, we find that the writer of Revelation is, is carried into the wilderness and he sees a woman sitting upon a scarlet-coloured beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And this woman, as Revelation says, it represents a system of blasphemy. In verse 5, she's, she's called a mother of harlots and an abomination of the earth. And in verse 6, her victims are the followers of Christ. And so this is an apostate religious system which has enough power to wield influence over the nations. And specifically in this chapter, influence over the beast, that is, the European nations. Well, if we consider the, the influence that the Catholic papacy has had in Europe today, it is enormous influence. Now, the Pope doesn't control Europe, but he wields enormous influence over European nations and people. Don't forget, Europe is predominantly a Catholic continent. And we could go through many examples of, of how the papacy influence, influences Europe today um, and, and different ways in which that is manifested. But just to, to cite one example, um, only last month the European Union awarded the Charlemagne Prize to the Pope, Pope Francis. Interestingly, Charlemagne was the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He was a Catholic who united several nations together to form a religious empire. And in his award ceremony, the Pope made some comments which were perhaps not so surprising to students of prophecy. He said, Europe is weary, ageing, no longer fertile, with mind and heart, with hope and without vain nostalgia, like a son who rediscovers in Mother Europe its, his roots of life and faith. I dream of a new European humanism, one that involves a constant work of humanisation and calls for memory, courage and a sound and humane utopian vision. I dream of a Europe that is still young, young, still capable of being a mother, 
a mother who has life because she respects life and offers hope for life. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of his speech was his desire to have a new Europe. He described his ideal Europe as a young female mother who is fertile. And as Francis expressed his desire for Europe to start afresh, fast forward one month and we're now, fa we're now facing potentially huge changes in Europe. One wonders if these changes which are ahead for Europe will present the Pope with the, just the perfect opportunity that he wants to realise his dream for Europe. Well, if you thought the Pope had great influence in European politics now, then consider how much influence he will have in Europe when the only non-Catholic nation, Britain, leaves. Can you imagine the effect on Catholic Europe if the only Protestant influence left the Union? All the remaining nations who are predominantly Catholic and who continually look to the Pope will, on will only swoon. <clears throat> Swoon to the Pope more than they do now, increasing his influence and his power. And as the influence of the Pope increases in Europe, the influence of the woman riding the beast will become so clearer to those who are watching as prophesied in Revelation. Well, the second notable change in Europe which will follow is the Ten Kingdoms or nations who give their power to the beast. And it's these ten kingdoms that will exist only for a short time before they will go to war with Christ and the saints, as the rest of the chapter describes in Revelation 17. Britain, or Britannia, as it was known back in the Roman times, was removed from Roman control just before the eastern component of the Roman Empire was formed. And so when Daniel describes these, these ten kingdoms, Britain is not a part of these ten kingdoms because it was not a part of the Roman Empire when it was divided into its eastern and western components. So while these ten kingdoms will arise in Europe who give their power to the beast and are influenced by the apostate teachings of the Pope, Britain will not be a part of these kingdoms. But the destiny of Europe without Britain will have been set in motion as ten Catholic-influenced nations prepare to oppose Christ and who see Christ as being the Antichrist. Well, do we see ten distinct nations in Europe today under, under one umbrella? Not, not now. But Europe is on the verge of enormous change, which could very well see those ten nations emerge and form a union or um, contribute to the European Union. The involvement of Britain in the third prophecy is more direct. We read earlier Ezekiel chapter 38, where, where we find a war against, the land, against Israel, and we see both British and European forces in opposition to each other. The prophecy here in Ezekiel 38 is a prophecy that is referring to the last days. In fact, it follows another Latter-day prophecy, which was fulfilled only about 70 years ago. And if you turn back for a minute to Ezekiel 36, where we're given an idea as to how accurate the prophecy of Ezekiel really is. In Ezekiel 36, we have the prophecy about the scattering of Israel amongst the nations, and then conversely, the prophecy of their regathering into the land. And in Ezekiel 36, if you just come to verse 19, God says, I scattered Israel amongst the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries. And we could read this a bit more in context, but if we could skip down to verse 24, God then says, I will take you, Israel, from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Now, if anything is a historical fact, no matter how secular or atheist you might be, no one can deny that the Jews were scattered after AD 70 and then regathered in Israel as a nation once again in 1948 just under 70 years ago. You know, we don't have time to go through this historically, but if you consider the odds, firstly, that a race such as the Jews who have been the subject of anti-Semitism throughout the ages 
with the likes of the Spanish Inquisition and the, the Holocaust in World War II? The odds that the Jews still exist as a race after 2,000 years of living amongst hostile nations, that, isn't, that is unprecedented in human history. And what is even more amazing is that this was prophesied by Ezekiel 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago. And so here we are today, 70 years on from the return of Israel to their own land. Um, and we know that reading from that same prophecy of, of, of Ezekiel, knowing that history, we're seeing that history is proving that um, Ezekiel is a book of truth. And so if we move, uh, turn a couple of chapters over back to Ezekiel 38, um, which is another prophecy that is set again in the latter days, just before the appearance of Christ. We find this invasion of Israel that is undertaken by Gog of the land of Magog, who is a power from the uttermost parts of the north of Israel. Many commentators um, have speculated as to who Gog is. The Romano-Jewish scholar Josephus identifies Magog as being the area of the ancient Scythians in an area today that is known as Russia. And so Magog is considered to be an alliance of Russia and European nations, predominantly Germany, who joins with Goma, France, to invade Israel. However, the nations who oppose and question the advances of Germany and Russia in verse 13 are Sheba, as we read earlier, Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. And Tarshish, biblically speaking, is Britain. We can go back to the characteristics of Tarshish as described in other parts of the Bible, um, which say that, that Tarshish was rich in specific minerals like tin. Um, and if we look back over Greek and Roman history, the only nation who supplied and mined tin was Britannia. Another characteristic described by Ezekiel which helps us identify Britain as Tarshish is that Tarshish was known to trade with Phoenicians, just as Ezekiel describes in chapter 27 and verse 12. So we know that Tarshish is talking about Britain. And here in verse um, 13, Ezekiel is speaking of a time when Britain will challenge the military advances of Germany and Russia who are invading Israel. Let's put the quote up, sorry about that. So that's in verse 13. Perhaps the most important implication is that you, um, and, and you'll notice is as you read through the different passages that we've quickly referred to tonight about the prophecies that relate to Britain, um, you would have noticed that the culmination of all of these events is the return of Christ to the world. And remember how at the beginning we considered the writings of Daniel, who said that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Well, that was a reminder that God is and always will be in control. The anxiety that we see in the nations now, the wars in the future, will all ultimately culminate in the fulfilment of God's plan for this earth, to have a kingdom of peace under the reign of Christ. And this is the ultimate fulfilment of all of these passages you know, if we just read from Daniel chapter 2 that we referred to earlier, um, in verse 44, the bottom quote there on the screen, it says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And this is talking about our time period, the, la the time period of the latter days. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Talking of the kingdom of Christ. Well, tonight we've only covered these principles behind the prophecies themselves that relate to the last days before the return of Christ. We have seen that if it were to happen, a Brexit would contribute to a range of geopolitical and sociocultural changes in Europe. How bad, we don't know. I'm sure we'll find out in four or five days' time when the vote happens. The changes that we would see would have the papal Catholic influence increase in Europe quite substantially. The ten key nations in Europe would arise um, 
within a union of itself without Britain. We know that from Revelation, in Daniel. The opposition of Britain to European forces in a Middle Eastern war, and we saw that in Ezekiel 38. And lastly, ultimately, the return of Christ, we would see, and the establishment of a kingdom of peace. And this message of the future kingdom of Christ is repeated throughout the Bible from the beginning to end. It's a message today that falls on deaf ears, but a prophecy that will soon be realised, just as the return of Israel, just as surely as the prophecy of the return of Israel was realised to their own land in 1948, 70 years ago.